The New York Times called Noam Chomsky arguably the most important intellectual, and the Boston Globe has referred to him as America's most useful citizen. Certainly, intellect and radical activist citizenship have been hallmarks and touchstones to a career in the public eye of one of the world's foremost linguistic experts, the creator of generative grammar and longtime MIT professor, now emeritus, of linguistics and philosophy. In addition to his pioneering work in linguistics, Noam Chomsky is the author of numerous best-selling political works, including America and the New Mandarins, Hegemony or Survival, and Imperial Ambitions. His newest book is called Failed States, The Abuse of Power and the Assault on Democracy. And he joins us for this morning's Second Hour Forum from Wellesley, Massachusetts, and a phone line that we hope is going to hold. Noam, good to have you back after all these years. Welcome. Yeah, very good to be here. I guess uh, I'd like to start uh, where you start. Uh, you start with um, Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein in your new book, and you get into something that, as you say, isn't probably talked about enough, and that is the nuclear threat by quoting those two and their concern about keeping the planet and making sure that aggression and uh, all the sort of things that lead to uh, volatility don't happen as much as we can stave them off. What I'm wondering is, especially since you mentioned people like Graham Allison, is the increased nuclear threat, and you mentioned, for example, militarization of space, is the increased nuclear threat because of the United States, as you seem to imply, largely and even more so than it is with North Korea, Iran, or bin Laden? Well, yeah, um, the, in terms of scale, there's just no question. Uh, the, uh, uh, the U.S. is, uh, and this, I think, is just a consensus among uh, strategic analysts and is more or less obvious from looking at it. Uh, the U.S. is far in the lead in uh, uh, escalating the serious threat of nuclear war. I mean, you can just take a look at the quotes I give and the sources I cite, which are from right in the mainstream. There's a serious threat from uh, from uh, North Korea, from uh, Iran, uh, and conceivably from Al Qaeda, but in large measure we're responsible for uh, escalating those threats. Uh, for example, why would uh, say take Iran, which is uh, in the case of Al Qaeda, the major threat is that they will somehow obtain. Uh, uh, well, conceivably a missile, but uh, possibly uh, material that can be used for nuclear weapons. Where are they going to get them? Well, one of the places they might get them, and may have them, in fact, is from the invasion of Iraq. Uh, the, it's discussed there. The, uh, you talk about the looting in your book. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this, there, was system, there, there were means to develop weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It was known. They were under uh, supervision of U.N. inspectors and being dismantled. Uh, when Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz sent their troops in, uh, inspectors were kicked out. They didn't bother safeguarding them. And they were systematically looted, systematically. Uh, UN investi- uh, uh, analysts continued to uh, inspect, inspect. So forgive me, there were WMDs, as you point out. Yes, they were there. They were being dismantled. Uh, also means to develop them, like precision, uh, high-tech precision equipment for, uh, that could be used for developing nuclear weapons. They were systematically looted, not by individuals. And uh, we can only uh, imagine and fear where that went to. But nevertheless, that's a pretty remote threat. Uh, Wouldn't it be as likely, excuse me, that they could go to the former Soviet Union or Pakistan, though? Well, Pakistan is most likely. That's been the center of the... I mean, the Soviet Union doesn't want to. But uh, Pakistan has been the center of the major smuggling operations for years. Uh, and where did the Pakistani nuclear weapons come from? Well, the Reagan administration. The Reagan administration pretended year after year, I stress pretended, that Pakistan was not developing nuclear weapons. They knew it was. Uh, it was, in fact. And uh, uh, one of their leading uh, nuclear weapons developers became the center of a major uh, a distribution network uh, sending uh, uh, parts and material for nuclear weapons all over the place. Uh, take, say, North Korea. I mean, there was an agreement. Of one of the good things that Clinton did was a framework agreement uh, which, uh, in which uh, 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 North Korea was to uh, uh, stop its uh, nuclear weapons-related activity, as apparently it did, as far as anyone knows, uh, in return to for... Uh, uh, actions by the United States, uh, like water reactor or other things. Uh, neither side totally lived up to its obligations, the U.S. included. But when Bush came in, he just abandoned it all. Uh, uh, said, no, we're not going to do this. Said, okay. Uh, they went back to uh, 
developing nuclear weapons, as everyone predicted. Uh, can it be dealt with? Yeah, in similar ways. I Iran is a more striking case. Uh, Iran, uh, as far as anyone knows, uh, is uh, living, w is operating within the framework of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. I mean, they may have something secret going on, and there's reasons for suspicions about that, but it's unknown. Uh, however, uh, Iran has uh, repeatedly uh, offered to uh, negotiate all of these issues. Uh, in 2003, for example, uh, Iran, this is under the moderate Khatami government, but with the support of the hardline clerics, uh, they offered to negotiate all outstanding issues, including uh, nuclear issues, including a two-state settlement for the uh, uh, Arab-Israel-Palestine uh, conflict, uh, the uh, everything. Uh, the Bush administration didn't respond. It uh, just censured the Swiss diplomat who had brought the offer. Well, those uh, offers have been repeated, including the two-state settlement, and they're just ignored. Uh, uh, the Well, that's a good way of uh, accelerating a conflict. Uh, uh, Iran did make a uh, an arrangement, a deal with the European Union, uh, uh, in which uh, 2004, in which they uh, agreed to suspend their legal, perfectly legal uh, uranium enrichment programs. They said they'd suspend them, and in return, the European Union was to provide, uh, phrasing was, firm guarantees on security issues. Well, we all know what that means. Security issues refer to the U.S.-Israeli threats to attack Iran. Now, those threats themselves are serious violations of international law, and Iran rightly wants some kind of guarantee that it won't be attacked. Well, the Bush administration refuses. The European Union couldn't live up to its side of the bargain. So finally, uh, Iran uh, uh, dropped uh, the bargain, too, and be returned to enriching uranium. But the way that's described in the West, mostly here almost universally, uh, is that Iran broke the agreement. That's you know it's not exactly the story. Well, they they say they're willing to go back to it. Uh, last January they again made a similar offer. Uh, they're willing to negotiate now. The U.S. has slightly shifted its position, and this is described in the press as a great shift uh, towards moderation and negotiation. But take a look at it. The U.S. has agreed to negotiate if under. Uh, uh, but it is unwilling to withdraw the threats, so it's willing to negotiate under, at the uh, you know at the point of a gun. That's not a negotiation. Furthermore, it's willing to negotiate on the condition that Iran agrees in advance to the desired outcome, namely permanent suspension of uranium enrichment. Well, you know that's uh, maybe you can sell that in the press, but that's not a serious offer. What about the narrative we're getting in the press here, though, that Iran essentially not only wants to destroy Israel, its prime minister has said that the Zionist entity should be annihilated, or words that have been, at least from Farsi, perhaps interpreted to mean that, and uh, they have certainly armed Hezbollah for that purpose? Uh, well, uh, uh, the West, uh, the U.S. in particular, loves uh, the ravings of uh, Ahmadinejad, and they're very widely publicized. But he has a superior... The, the what's called the, what they call the supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei, who's the you know, who's in charge, uh, and probably in a reprimand to Ahmadinejad, uh, he repeated uh, last June, I think it was the uh, he repeated the uh, Iranian proposal uh, to accept a two-state settlement to the uh, Arab uh, to the Palestine-Israel uh, conflict. Uh, the way he put it was that Iran accepts the position of the Arab League on this issue. Well, the position of the Arab League is the 2002 uh, Arab League agreement to a Saudi plan. Uh, Palestinians also agreed. Uh, the plan was for full normalization of relations with Israel uh, if it accepts the international consensus on a two-state settlement. Well, that's Iran. Uh, that's the superior uh, to uh, Ahmadinejad. I don't think that was published anywhere, but it's a far more important, I mean, in, in the mainstream at least, uh, but it's a far more important statement uh, than Ahmadinejad's, and it's been reaffirmed. 
so you can read in the London Financial Times that it was reaffirmed by an Iranian diplomat uh, a couple of weeks ago. Well, the West doesn't want to hear that. Uh, what about uh, arming Hezbollah? Hezbollah? Hezbollah is regarded in Lebanon. It's in Lebanon. It's just called the resistance. Let's take a look at this morning's newspapers. They conceded by now. It's the resistance. Uh, do they want to destroy Israel? Well, Hezbollah's uh, leader, uh, Nasrallah, has uh, said explicitly that uh, uh, he doesn't regard Israel as a legitimate state, uh, and uh, Hezbollah won't accept it. But if the Palestinians accept a two-state settlement, that's uh, he'll go along. They won't disrupt it. He says it's a Palestinian issue. Whatever the Palestinians accept, uh, they will accept. Uh, they're a Lebanese organization, and they uh, deeply integrated into Lebanon. Uh, and... Uh, uh, they want to solve the problems of Lebanon in, 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 in the way that they prefer. Talking with Noam Chomsky, his new book is called Failed States, The Abuse of Power and the Assault on Democracy. The thesis of your book, uh, Noam Chomsky, seems to be that the U.S. is a terrorist state under its own definition, and it doesn't comply with the universal law, in other words, following the principles that it expects out of other nations. Uh, you also call it a failed state because of something you describe as democratic deficit, that public opinion is not reflected by public policy. Um, it goes back, I think, in many ways, does it not, to some of your earlier work where you say public policy is shaped by media, but nevertheless people sort of in some ways uh, really come above that? Yeah, but I've been, I and plenty of others have been writing about this for a long time, but it is reaching pretty extreme levels. In this, in this book, in fact, I run through uh, some of the recent uh, the kind of public opinion studies that were taken right before and right after the 2004 election, and they're pretty striking. Uh, they show uh, a, a dramatic gap between public policy and public opinion. That's one of the reasons why the party managers uh, made it uh, uh, were very careful to ensure that uh, issues would basically be off the agenda in the 2004 election. It would be restricted to what the PR industry calls uh, qualities or personality or something like that. And most of the public just remained quite, totally unaware of the uh, positions of candidates on issues. So, so take, say, you know, the Kyoto Protocol as an example. Uh, as you know, the, the government, including the near-unanimous Senate, Democrats, too, uh, rejected it. Uh, the Bush administration said it's, gone, it's all gone, it's finished forever. We're not going to have anything to do with it. Uh, the public supports it so strongly that a majority of Bush voters assumed that he supported it. Uh, that's only one example. I'll give a long list there, just quoting the public opinion studies. Uh, what's happened is that, uh, roughly speaking, both political parties are pretty far to the right of uh, the general population on a host of serious issues. And these figures are particularly striking because public opinion is uh, constructed almost person by person. The people are not repeating what they read or what they hear because they don't hear it and they don't read it. But what we read is of red states and of uh, evangelicals who take conservative positions and support the president's policies uh, and all do. that. And many of them, do. not all, of course, but a majority of evangelicals do. And they have been mobilized as a political force. But that's not the majority of the population. If you take a look at uh, uh, popular attitudes on uh, peace key on international affairs, on uh, um, uh, international crises, who should take the lead on uh, uh, the so-called war on terrorism, on domestic issues like health care, uh, uh, on and on. It's just radically different. I mean, one of the most striking examples was the major study of public opinion right after the federal budget was announced in uh, February 2005, first federal budget of the second Bush administration. There was a major study by the Program on International Policy Attitudes, the most respected polling institution. Uh, public attitudes were almost the opposite of the of the budget budget, where the budget was going up. The public wanted them to go it to go down by large majorities. Uh, military spending, uh, supplementals for Iraq and Afghanistan, and so on, where spending was going down, the public wanted to go up. 
also by very large majorities. Uh, health, education, uh, welfare, uh, renewable energy, uh, support for the United Nations, uh, just right through a long list. Actually, I quote the results there. Well, there's an, uh, another useful comment about this is that uh, the results were apparently not reported. A friend of mine who does database searches uh, checked carefully and couldn't find a single report in any American newspaper of very dramatic information, information that says the public is completely opposed, radically opposed, to, uh, uh, to, to the federal budget, meaning public policy. And the same has been true on occasion after occasion. That's a serious problem inside the United States. Talking with Noam Chomsky again, his new book is Failed States, The Abuse of Power and the Assault on Democracy. You mentioned Michael Scheuer, who's been on this program, uh, leading U.S. Uh, terrorist specialist, and talk about his view, which is, I think, pretty much your view, that uh, once again the policies of the invasion of Iraq, uh, and which you pretty much linked to oil, but have increased the threat of terror. Uh, of course, President Bush has said publicly it's better to fight the foreign forces and the uh, terrorists on their own turf, meaning Iraq, presumably. But as you point out in the book, you've got about 5 to maybe 10 percent only of forces from outside of Iraq. Not only that, but uh, I also point out there, quoting uh, Anthony Cordesman and other terrorism specialists, that according to Israeli and Saudi intelligence, who are the most uh, informed, that 5 to 10 percent are... Uh, almost entirely people who had no no earlier records. They were mobilized by the attack on Iraq. Uh, I quote other terrorism specialists who, actually I think there's a near consensus on this, who point out that the uh, yeah, Iraq, Bush is now fighting terrorists in Iraq, but he created them. They weren't there before. It's an incubator for training terrorists. Is it's what you're an saying, incubator yeah. for training terrorists. That's the CIA's conclusion. Actually, it was the warning as well. The same intelligence agencies and uh, terrorism specialists who are now um, reporting and lamenting the sharp increase in terror caused by the war in Iraq, uh, before the war they were warning of the same thing. And we didn't need them to figure it out. It's obvious that it's going to happen. And it's not like the same is going to happen the, almost surely is going to be the result of the uh, U.S.-Israeli uh, invasion of Lebanon. It's creating new generations of... Uh, uh, radical Islamist jihadists. You bring a lot of history to bear in the book, some of it fascinating. I mean, early on when you talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis and how close, even by a word, we came to actually uh, a nuclear threat, but also later on talking about the invasion of Iraq and the historical precedent going back to uh, Jackson, that is President Jackson, a Andrew Jackson, and John Quincy Adams, the Secretary of State. This is fascinating. Uh, well, actually, the reason I bring that up is because the major, there's one major scholarly book by John Lewis Gaddis, a well-known, respected Yale historian, uh, who, uh, uh, it, the book is about the roots of the Bush Doctrine, which he approves of, I mean, criticizes tactics, but basically approves of. So that's the major scholarly book on the roots of the Bush Doctrine. He starts with Andrew Jackson and the Seminole Wars and John Quincy Adams. And what I did in reviewing it is just point out the facts which he ignores from his own sources. I mean, using his own sources, the right scholarly sources, I just report what they, in fact, say. It's almost the opposite of his conclusions. And, in fact, uh, what they say is correct. And that probably is the roots of the Bush Doctrine, and it's shocking and dangerous. The idea that uh, a war could be fought without congressional approval. Not Partly that, and uh, Adams, in fact, recognized with regret later in his life that this had established the precedent of wars fought in violation of the Constitution, uh, executive wars. But much more serious than that is the principle which uh, Gaddis actually recognizes and emphasizes. Uh, he said the, the Adams-Jackson uh, War, which was the conquest of Florida and the destruction of the um, Seminoles, uh, what they called the lawless Indians and uh, uh, the runaway slaves. Uh, the, uh, that, uh, the principle behind it, as he says, was that expansion is the path to security. So if you want security, you have to expand. Well, that's, that, that is a doctrine, and that is the Bush doctrine, except now it's expand 
the whole world and, in fact, to space. Sure, if you want total security, you're going to have to rule everything. And what you're going to do by ruling everything is create insecurity, like, for example, increasing the threat of terror and of nuclear proliferation. What do you say to the kind of criticism you get, which has been strong through the years, that you uh, essentially take too anti-American a line and that you're much too harsh, especially for a Jewish American on Israel? Well, first of all, the idea that I take an anti-American line is a very intriguing one. Uh, It's a standard uh, concept in totalitarian states. If you identify state power with uh, the culture, the society, the population, uh, and so on, if you make that identification, strict totalitarian doctrine, then a person who criticizes state policy is uh, anti-American. Uh, in the Soviet Union, they used to call them anti-Soviet. So the dissidents were anti-Soviet. They weren't against Russia you know, or against Russian culture or Russian people, but they were against state policy. Uh, so it's a striking totalitarian concept. It's an interesting fact about the United States that it's used freely here, but almost in no democratic society. I mean, take, say, Italy. If somebody criticizes Berlusconi's policies, and nobody called them anti-Italian. Uh, so it's hegemony, really, that brings that out. Yeah. It's a criticism of policy. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, uh, actually, don't know, if you want to know the history, uh, every Israeli knows, because they know the Bible, uh, the origins of the concept uh, anti-Israel. It goes back to uh, the Bible. It goes back to King Ahab, who was the epitome of evil in the Bible. Uh, and... Uh, He uh, condemned the prophet Elijah for being uh, what he called in Hebrew a hater of Israel. Was he a hater of the Jews? No, he was a. He condemned the acts of the evil king that made him a hater of Israel. Well, you know that's the origins of this concept, this totalitarian concept. Let me ask you to hold that thought because we're coming up on a break, and I want to invite our listeners to join us. In fact, you're cordially invited to participate in this live program. Our guest, Noam Chomsky, your calls are welcome, toll-free, 866-733-6786. Whether you're listening to us on radio, Internet, or Sirius Satellite, join us at that number. It's toll-free, 866-733-6786. Or if you'd like to join us with questions or comments by email, you can do that as well. Our email address is forum, F-O-R-U-M, at kqed.org. Talking with Professor Noam Chomsky, and his new book, again, is Failed States, The Abuse of Power and the Assault on Democracy. This is Forum. I'm Michael Krasny. This is Forum. I'm Michael Krasny. We're talking this hour with Noam Chomsky, whose new book is called Failed States, The Abuse of Power and the Assault on Democracy. He's with us from Wellesley, Massachusetts, and we're going to go to your calls here forthwith. I just want to follow through on something brought up before we went to the break. I guess, uh, Professor Chomsky, the criticism has been not only perhaps too harsh on Israel, which I think you just answered quite well, but uh, that you have perhaps also maybe not been critical enough, in fact, I've seen this in print a couple of times, of uh, the treatment of the Palestinians by the Arab states. Yeah, I've been quite critical about that, but uh, yes, it's true. I don't concentrate on that. There's a very simple reason for it. Uh, you and I uh, happen to share responsibility for what uh, the U.S. and Israel are doing to the Palestinians. Uh, we have only the most indirect responsibility for what uh, the Arab states are doing. The Arab states hate them. I've pointed that out over and over and have undermined them at every point. But, and, uh, uh, but we have responsibility for what we do and what we can influence. I mean, we could indirectly influence the Arab states. So our closest ally uh, and oldest ally and most valued ally in the Middle East is uh, Saudi Arabia where the oil is, uh, the most extreme fundamentalist uh, 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 government in the world. It makes Iran look like a flourishing democracy. So yes, we have a certain amount of influence on Saudi Arabia. And we could, for example, we could influence Saudi Arabia. So for example, uh, let's take a current exa- a case. Uh, the Arab League, in the, in the invasion of Lebanon, the Arab League uh, in defiance of public opinion, as was pointed out, uh, the Arab League leaders, the tyrants who run the states, uh, took a mildly pro-Israeli stance uh, and a stance that's harmful to the Palestinians. 
Well, we could have influenced them to do the opposite, except that that's what the U.S. government wanted. In fact, they had to back down under pressure from their own populations. Uh, as for Lebanon, you know, my, where I was last May, you know, I think that uh, as I spoke there, it's a, don't have to talk about it here, uh, they, they should be uh, offered uh, decent uh, lives in existence in, in Lebanon instead of being confined in miserable refugee camps. Okay, that's a serious problem for Lebanese to deal with. It doesn't make much sense for me to criticize it. I mean, I do when I'm there, but not here, here rarely. The overwhelming issue, uh, both in scale and because it's our responsibility and we can do something about it, is U.S.-Israeli policy. So sure, we ought to concentrate on that. I mean, it's, it's, we, we understand that principle very well with regard to uh, official enemies. So let's take, say, Soviet dissidents. I mean, do we care what they said about the, uh, the United States or, uh, you know, the Congo or anyone else? We cared about what they said about the Soviet Union. Or take Iranian dissidents today. Do we care whether they uh, condemn the Israeli invasion of Lebanon? No. We care what they're saying about Iran. And that same principle applies to us. Even more so, because we have uh, privilege and uh, live in a very free society, so we can do lots of things that they can't do. And we're talking with Noam Chomsky. We'll try to get as many of you on here with us as we can. We begin, Ken, with you. Good morning. Welcome to the forum. Hi. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I, uh, I really, Noam Chomsky, you're one of my b biggest heroes. I, I rent all your DVDs, and I watch them carefully, and they just make me feel um, so well-informed and in the world. And I just have a question for you about Iraq and the beginning of the war. I have this theory that um, the sanctions were about to come off Iraq, and Iraq had already had these signed contracts with France, Germany, China, etc., to sell their oil to those countries. And uh, American oil companies and George Bush couldn't let that happen, so they invaded they annulled those contracts and signed a contract with only American companies. And I, and I, I feel like that was their justification for the war. Now, I was just wondering what you thought about that. And I can hang up and listen. Yeah. All right. Thank you for the call. Thanks. Well, first, thanks for the kind comment. Uh, we don't – nobody knows the answer to that question. We don't have uh, in, information about the internal discussions and debates going on uh, within the executive branch. And there's a more general point that we should bear in mind. Uh, why are all these things kept secret? Why is there a classified record? Well, if you run through the declassified record in the United States or anywhere else that I know about, uh, you discover that the issues are not security, except security of the government from its own population. They essentially want to keep the population in ignorance of what they're doing usually for good reasons, those we mentioned earlier, the public is usually opposed. So we don't know what their internal thinking was. What you describe may very well have been a factor. My judgment, and it's just an assessment, uh, yours is as good as mine, uh, but my assessment is it was not a major factor. Uh, the major factor, I think, was to ensure that uh, the U.S. government maintains control over the vast energy resources of the Middle East. I stress control, not access. Policies would be the same if uh, we were on uh, solar energy. In fact, they were the same when the U.S. didn't use a drop of Middle East oil. Uh, the point is control for reasons that were clearly expressed uh, 60 years ago, uh, namely that this is what the State Department called a stupendous source of strategic power, uh, uh, the most strategically important area in the world. If you control the energy resources, you have a lever of control over the whole world. So that's extremely important. Uh, the U.S. had to withdraw its forces, military forces, from Saudi Arabia. The Pentagon recognized this. Wolfowitz talked about it because it was just stirring up uh, uh, enormous uh, uh, popular anger. In fact, it's one of the main sources of al-Qaeda. So they wanted to withdraw them from Saudi Arabia. They have to place them somewhere else. They do have them in the Emirates, but there couldn't be a better place than Iraq. For one thing, Iraq has the, as far as is known, the second largest uh, energy resources in the world. Also, they're very cheap and accessible. You don't have to dig through tar sands and stuff. Uh, and it's right at the heart of the energy-producing region. If they could uh, install a client state in Iraq, which would do their bidding, kind of like, you know, El Salvador, Guatemala, and so on, 
if they could install a client state and place their military bases there, oh, they would be in an extremely important, powerful position. To use Big Nav Brzezinski is one of the more astute of the small planning circles. Happened to be critical of the war, but he pointed out that if the U.S. succeeds in Iraq, uh, it will have what he called critical leverage over its industrial rivals, uh, Asian and European. Uh, critical leverage comes from having your hand on the spigot. Uh, that's been a guiding policy for 60 years. So my guess is that's the main, that was the main driving force. You mentioned the troops in Saudi Arabia, and in your book you talk about troops in Muslim lands uh, pretty much being at the top of uh, bin Laden's concerns or caveats to the West. Uh, along Particularly with, Saudi Arabia, because that's the most holy land. We right, have. Medina and, and Mecca there. And, but you also mentioned predatory capitalism, and, and I found myself wondering, is it your sense that if we would uh, take troops out of all Muslim lands and perhaps be less predatory in our, in Ka- we being the United States, uh, that there would still not be the desire by bin Laden and his minions to establish some kind of caliphate uh, over the world as we have been reading about? Well, they don't actually call for a caliphate over the world. I mean, they're crazy enough, but not that. What they call for is for a caliphate over Muslim lands. They have never indicated any desire to uh, establish a caliphate in Western Europe, which would be ludicrous. In fact, you can see what happened in uh, Russia and Afghanistan. I mean, as long as the Russians were invading Afghanistan, uh, uh, as Russian troops were there, uh, they were organized by the U.S., in fact. they were uh, The jihadis were fighting the Russians. In fact, they even carried out terrorism within Russia during those years. As soon as Russia withdrew, that was the end of uh, a jihadi terrorism against Russia from Afghanistan. End. No more. Uh, it did continue, but from Chechnya, which is also an occupied Muslim land. And they've been pretty consistent about this. I suspect that... Uh, Michael Scheuer might have said this if you asked him. I think that people who have followed al-Qaeda closely uh, understand and agree that their actions are pretty much consistent with their words. He did say that, but he also seemed to feel that there was enough enmity against the West that they and against uh, what we could call the Judeo-Christian world that he, they would like to see. They, they would ex- like to what? I'm sorry. They, they would like to see essentially a, an annihilation of, of, as they saw on, on 9-11, of many of those who are not of their faith or their belief. Yeah, well, not the 9-11 case is interesting. First of all, the background of it, as, again, he's written and others have written like him, uh, is the, the initial, what, what turned Osama bin Laden against the United States uh, was uh, uh, in 1990. Uh, he wanted to uh, lead a jihad against Iraq when it invaded Kuwait, and uh, the Saudi military, backed by the United States, refused. Then they invited American troops, which to him or any you know religious, uh, ultra-religious uh, Muslim, is uh, the uh, utter indignity and total violation of Quranic principles and so on, uh, inviting uh, infidel troops to the holiest country. Well, at that point, he turned against the United States. Uh, uh, the first attack on the World Trade Center, remember, was uh, uh, 1993, shortly after that, probably not Osama bin Laden, but uh, Egyptian-based jihadis. Uh, and so it continues. Uh, from their point of view, as Scheuer has written, it's a defensive war. Uh, you can hate it or like it, but they perceive themselves as fighting a defensive war, uh, the invasion of uh, Muslim lands. Now, it's also worth bearing in mind that the jihadi uh, groups and organizations, uh, even the most militant of them, were quite angry about 9-11 and bitterly opposed to it. Uh, There's very good studies of this by Fawaz Gergis, who's the main American scholar on these topics and has studied the jihadis very closely. Uh, He reviews the facts and cites, you know, angry fatwas by leading radical clerics denouncing Osama bin Laden for carrying out uh, the 9-11 attack, which they were opposed to. Uh, they regarded it as adventurous and uh, immoral and in violation of Islamic principles and so on. Well, okay, at that point, uh, Bush decided to, or his, you know, his handlers, uh, decided to invade Afghanistan. Okay, 
here's the U.S. Ta- again attacking a Muslim land. So that changed all that. The same clerics who had... Uh, a Muslim land that was essentially giving sanctuary, of course, to Osama bin Laden. Though. Well, it, it was, and uh, there might very well have been a diplomatic solution for that. Uh, recall that the, the war was not undertaken to overthrow the Taliban. That was not a war. That came three weeks later after the bombing. The war was uh, undertaken with the official aim, demand, that uh, the Taliban hand over uh, Osama bin Laden and uh, you know, his colleagues. Well, the Taliban took an ambiguous attitude toward that. They asked for evidence. And notice that Bush didn't call for extradition. That would require evidence. He just said, hand them over. Uh, the Taliban said, uh, well, give us some evidence. Uh, and they made various other proposals, which may have been serious or may not. We don't know because the Bush administration rejected them, insisted that he hand them over, even though they had no evidence. In fact, they conceded that they had no evidence. Uh, eight months later, the uh, head of the FBI, Robert Miller, gave a long interview in the Washington Post, his first discussion of this, in which he said eight months later, we suspect that the 9-11 plot was hatched in Afghanistan but implemented in Germany and the United Arab Emirates. Well, if that's what they suspected eight months later, they didn't know it in October. So they couldn't hand over evidence because they didn't have it. Uh, could that have been pursued? Well, again, we don't know because it wasn't tried. Uh, they insisted on bombing, bombing the, tele- the Afghans until they follow U.S. orders. In fact, that became explicit by the end of the month, by the end of October. Uh, the, they announced that uh, we. They announced to the Afghan people, "We'll continue to bomb you unless you uh, throw out uh, the Taliban government." Well, you know that's pure terrorism, uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, Muslims all over the world bitterly opposed it, as, as did many others. Incidentally, the idea that there was word, wild, widespread support for this is just a myth. You can read the Gallup polls in late September. Of, when they were talking about the bombing, there was overwhelming opposition to it throughout the world, particularly in Latin America, where, there's, like in Mexico, I think there was 2% support. Uh, these are the countries that have had some experience with... Uh, but not in the United States. The United States was different, and England was somewhat different. But the only two countries in an international Gallup poll that gave support to the uh, in, impending bombing, the only two were India, outside the U.S. and Britain, uh, the only two were uh, uh, India and, the, and Israel. But India and Israel had no interest whatsoever in Afghanistan. Uh, India was thinking about Kashmir, and Israel was thinking about the Palestinians. Hmm. We've got more callers in here. And uh, Mick, you're on. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for the show. And uh, Dr. Chomsky, thank you for being a continuous voice of reason and, and sanity in a time that's really neither, in my opinion. Um, I, I think it would be interesting to note as well, let's not forget, wasn't there a Taliban delegation that came to Texas in the mid-'90s to did negotiate a pipeline with UNICAL? So there was some friendship there at one point. But my real uh, question was, in what I perceive as well as an age of sort of neo-totalitarianism in this country and blanket ignorance with good percentage of the population, my main issue has been the elections. I believe we've had two coup d'etat. Uh, and the statistics bear that out for any rational, free-thinking person. Uh, if I could, I'd just say Dr. Stephen Freeman from the University of Pennsylvania has written great analyses, statistical analyses, raw election uh, data, et cetera. And I'm wondering if my premise is correct, that the elections essentially are so rigged with all these electronic voting machines, et cetera, and they've actually been stolen twice in terms of presidential, not to mention others. How does a population count that's basically – for the most part ignorant of what's going on, counter this massive, fraudulent hijacking of our electoral system. You can't throw them out of office. What do you do? Thanks very much. Thank you for the call. Well, Tom Chapsky. I don't disagree. I, mean, I think you can certainly make a case that the elections were won by fraud. Uh, but if you, if you want my personal opinion, that's a minor issue. I mean, the elections are the, – the electoral vote, both in 2000 and 2004 was pretty close to 50-50. I mean, maybe there's some chicanery and juggling and so on. But it was, it was kind of like tossing a coin. The real issue, the fundamental issue about the elections, in my opinion, is that they didn't take place in the first place. 
you don't have elections when the two political parties uh, are unwilling to allow uh, issues to be discussed by the population. And uh, when the elections are run openly by the public relations industry, which sells candidates the same way they sell toothpaste on television. You know, when you look at a television ad, say a car ad, you don't expect to learn anything from it. I mean, if we had a market system, anything like it, uh, General Motors would put up a notice saying, here are the car models we're, we want to sell next year, here are their characteristics. They don't do that. Uh, they put up uh, you know, a football player or a, an actress or a car carrying out some miraculous action or something, and they try to delude you with imagery, not tell you about the, not give you information. I mean, we all know this. We know that it's all delusion and imagery. Well, when they sell candidates, they do the same thing. So they create imagery of Bush and imagery of Kerry. They keep away from the issues. Uh, the people, the population doesn't know the stands of the, of the candidates on issues. And we look at the... You see the debates as useless, futile? The debates are almost useless. They're just, first of all, they're, they're highly programmed. Uh, the, uh, and, the candid, and the candidates will not discuss the issues. I mean, just to take one example, take... The last debate, October 28th, I think it was, it was, on, it was focused on domestic issues. Well, for the American population, uh, the most significant domestic issue, or very high or highest for a long time, has been the collapsing health care system. I mean, it's the worst in the industrial world by a long shot, and people suffer from it. And for, for a long time, a major, large majority of the population has wanted some kind of national health care system. Uh, that's been shown in poll after poll. Okay, here we come to a, a debate on uh, uh, domestic issues. Uh, and actually, the New York Times the next day accurately described what happened. It praised it, but described it accurately. It said that Kerry refused to mention any kind of government role in health care because it has so little political support. Uh, the only support it has is an overwhelming majority of the population. But from the standpoint of the political managers and the liberal press, like the New York Times, that's not political support. Political support means support from the pharmaceutical corporations and the insurance, in, uh, the financial institutions, and so on. That's true. They don't support it. So therefore, it has no political support, uh, and Kerry didn't mention it. Well, what about the population? They're just not part of the system. I mean, and that generalizes in case after case after case. It's because of lobbying, isn't true, it, really? You don't have elections. I mean, it's, it's because of pressure groups and lobbying. And, and the money. Th it's because of pressure groups and lobbying, and they're not only representing what goes on in government, but also donating large amounts to the campaigns. You know, I mean, there's a very narrow concentration of uh, economic power in the country. We all know that. And that overwhelmingly dominates the uh, electoral system. In fact, what ta take, say, the upcoming elections, 2006, uh, the whole House of Representatives is coming up for election. Well, you go back to the founding fathers, say, Madison. The conception was the House of Representatives would be the democratic part of the government. People would actually, their opinions would actually be represented there. But the Senate, uh, which, as Madison put it, uh, uh, involved, is restricted to the wealth of the nation, the most res responsible group of men, those who have uh, sympathy with property and so on, the Senate would be the dominant force, and the population would be kind of removed from, mostly from picking senators. But the, the House is supposed to be the democratic force. Take a look at the next election that's coming up. Count the number of House seats that are even contested. Uh, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's a small percentage. Uh, count the number of incumbents who are defeated. I mean, it has become the least democratic uh, component of government uh, because it, it's all bought. It's also uh, certainly attributable, is it not, to gerrymandering and to just gerrymandering is the power case. of incumbency. I mean, it's our whole system. Yeah, I mean, gerrymandering is a striking case. In, in the last election, 2004, uh, the reason the Republicans did not uh, decline in uh, uh, House 
membership was because of the radical gerrymandering in Texas, which uh, set up a situation in which Democrats can't win. Let me get uh, you on here. Chuck, good morning. Welcome to Forum. Uh, good morning. Thanks very much. Uh, you mentioned the militarization of, militarization of space. I'd be interested if you had any specific information about weapon systems or the role of NASA in that. And uh, what do you think we should do in Iraq? If we withdraw the populations caught in the middle of a civil war, if we train up an Iraqi military uh, in the absence of a democratic government, it seems like it's just going to be our proxies fighting other proxies. Or we could establish a real democratic government and give them a peaceful way to resolve uh, their differences. But that's kind of what we say we're trying to do now. So uh, I'd be real interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, on Chuck's militarization of space, in time's brief, I would just suggest that you take a look at the sources that are cited in the book of mine that just came out, which basically says everything that I know about it. You know, runs through the specialist literature, and it's about what I can say uh, on Iraq. Uh, the United States definitely does not want a democratic government in Iraq. I mean, that's almost certain. The the idea of if just think for a minute what the I mean, it's amazing that this isn't discussed. There's an enormous discussion about withdrawal, uh, you know, exit strategies and so on. But they almost never mention the crucial issue. The crucial issue is that a sovereign Iraq, which is moderately democratic would be a nightmare for U.S. planners. I mean, a sovereign democratic Iraq would have a, uh, would be, would have a Shiite majority. It was mildly democratic. They'd be the major force. The Iraqi Shiites have pretty close relations to Iran. Uh, the, one of the main uh, militias in the south, the Bada Brigade, was trained in Iran. Uh, the clerics, who were very influential, have very close relations with Iran. Uh, the Ayatollah Sistani, the major one, was born in Iran. They still have Iranian citizenship. This has come up on the show, excuse me, and uh, some experts have said, yes, but they have a distinct Iraqi identity and they don't necessarily uh, follow marching orders from Tehran. Oh, I agree with that. They, you know, they don't necessarily love Iran, but they would much rather have friendly relations with their powerful neighbor than hostile relations. But aren't you also saying that you would think that a sovereign democratic state in Iraq would mean essentially the United States would not have a client state? That's your argument, isn't it? Well, the U.S. Would, is desperately eager to make it a client state. But suppose they can't. Suppose it becomes sovereign and democratic, mildly democratic. Then it will, it's already doing it, but it will increase its linkages to Iran. Furthermore, there's another problem. Uh, right across the border in Saudi Arabia, there's a majority Shiite population. Uh, they've been very harshly oppressed by the ruling uh, tyranny that the U.S. supports. And as you, there are some moves towards sovereignty and independence in Shiite Iraq, um, uh, uh, they too are calling for rights, maybe for a degree of autonomy and so on. That happens to be where, so, where Saudi oil is concentrated. So the I'm sure Washington planners are contemplating what could be an ultimate nightmare, a Shiite alliance, kind of a loose Shiite alliance, uh, southern Iraq, Iran, uh, the Saudi Arabian Shiite areas, uh, independent of the United States, controlling most of the world's oil. I mean, that would be devastating for U.S. Uh, plans going back uh, 60 years, with the British almost 100 years. Uh, furthermore, it can get worse. Uh, the U.S. can intimidate Europe. U.S. shakes its fist and says, uh, withdraw investments for Iran, uh, big European companies do it. The U.S. cannot intimidate China. It's one of the reasons they're so afraid of China. It's not that it's a military force. It just isn't intimidated. Uh, and they're increasing uh, investments, uh, uh, trade, uh, not only with Iran, uh, but even with Saudi Arabia, the crown in the, in the, you know, the jewel in the crown for the United States. Uh, that could continue if there's... Uh, uh, be accelerated even if there's an independent, uh, sovereign, mildly democratic Iraq. Now, these are all things that the U.S. is going to try to stop by any means it can. Whether it can stop them, well, that's another question. But that must be a high priority. That's why the U.S. has been so strongly opposed to democracy in Iraq. Now, sure, they talk about it, but everyone talks about democracy everywhere. Got a constitution. <laughs> well, the U.S. tried to write the constitution. And when the Iraqis refused, the U.S. had to back off. 
the U.S. tried to eliminate elections with caucuses and all sorts of other devices, and the invading army was forced to back off, not by insurgents. They can deal with that. Uh, they were forced to back off by massive nonviolent resistance, huge I'm demonstration. I mean, this is one of the real triumphs of nonviolent resistance. I regret that we've come to the end of the hour, but as always, it's good to have you on, good to talk with you, and thank you so much for being with us, Noam Chomsky. 